<laughs> Hi, everyone. Welcome back to Growing Up in Scientology. We're talking again today with Chris Shelton. Hi, Chris. Hey, Aaron. Happy to be here. Awesome. So, um, so last week, thereabouts, I did an interview with Gear Iseen, and um, and then I messaged both you and Nathan Rich, and I said, "Hey, I have an idea. Can why don't you guys watch the interview I did with Gear? Pick the parts that you uh, disagree with, that you feel need more debate, um, and then let's have conversations about it. And yep. the goal here." wasn't um to pick on gear <laughs> no but to um get a dialogue going between former scientologists who may not see things the same way and uh, i don't know almost serve as an example of it's okay to talk to each other about things that people disagree on in this subject it's not um it's not necessary for um it's not necessary for people to have to pick sides and fight each other. No one has to right. see everything the same way. Uh, That's right. And, and I just want to say from the get-go, I actually very, um, very happy with this effort and with what you're doing, and and happy to be part of it. So thanks for asking me to be, be on this because I think this is very necessary. There is divisiveness and there is um, some hateful rhetoric in the X community. Um, I found this to be true in all X communities. Uh, not just in the ex Scientology community, because I've, you know, dealt with uh, the ex JWs, ex Mormons, um, it, even and another and some other Christian cults, and um, and you find it, you know, kind of a, a universal trait that everybody doesn't always get along in groups, and that's fine. But sometimes it gets really weird and really divisive and really uh, hatey, and that shouldn't be that. That that's not, it's just unnecessary. And so I think anything we can do to chill that out would be uh, would be helpful. Totally. Yeah, I mean, the idea that you are supposed to condemn someone, publicly condemn them, right. um, because let's say it's a friend of yours. You're supposed to publicly condemn someone for saying something that isn't completely in lockstep with what you personally believe. I go, what the fuck is that about? Um, right. now you see this in politics these days. You see this everywhere. So it's not, again, like you said, we're not talking about something unique. Um, right. But I have seen people try to pit people against each other in this yes. Scientology community. And I, uh, on the one hand, I despise it. And on the un other hand, I sort of chuckle because there are people who are perceived as being as polar opposites who are in fact not – and it doesn't right. see things differently. It just means, no, that doesn't make them opposites and it doesn't make them not like each other and it doesn't make them on the same page. Like, who's to define what the fucking page is or how big that page is? Um, <laughs> so I think, I, 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 not too long ago, I watched uh, the interview that you and I did together in person when I was in Denver at your place. Um, huh. And I remember, I, I had forgotten that I started out that interview by going... I think people are going to get a kick out of this because I think there's an idea that you and I see things so differently we wouldn't even get along. Right. That's right. <laughs> and That's it's, right. it's not true. Exactly. Um, okay, so let's get down to uh, – let's just get down to the hardest part of this. Like let's just go down essentially a bullet point of what you felt were incorrect conclusions or incorrect whatever. Um, yep. In the interview, and again, we're not just picking on gear because I, I agreed with most of what gear said. But so let's it's it's just the interview, yeah. just the whole thing. Absolutely, and 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 I am not going to say anything bad here about guy or gear directly because I don't have I have met him once in person in Toronto. He's a nice guy, uh, very cute kid, beautiful wife. Uh, I'm sure he's living a wonderful life, and I have nothing against him personally. I will address his views. And his, and his opinions about things, because there were only two things he came off saying that I thought were, hmm, might have required a little bit more thought. And here's, here's the thoughts on it. First thing, and I think the most important one, is that there is sometimes a non-recognition of the fact that people's views change over time. Uh, coming out of a destructive cult situation, you are in a process of recovery. Whether you want to call it that or not doesn't matter to me. That is what it is. Um, and I'm not trying to say that like that's some, some forceful assertion. It's just you've now come out of 
a, a, a situation and now you're going to change your views and you're going to reevaluate what you looked at and what you were part of and what you were doing. That's called recovery. <laughs> so uh, it doesn't mean you have to be in therapy to be doing recovery. So uh, during the course of that, over time, as more time and more distance and more views and more opinions come into your space, as you become more educated about things, your views change. My, mine have changed radically over the last five years. When I first got out of Scientology and first got out of the Sea Org and started speaking out about it, I was pissed. I was furious. I didn't express myself in a furious manner, but that doesn't mean I wasn't furious. I was seething with what had happened to me and the betrayal and everything. Over time, my views have changed. They have softened to a degree. I've, I've gained more understanding of what happened to me and what happens to other people. And it's not that I have any less... Uh, it's not that I think Scientology is any better than I thought it was when I first left, but my emotions about it are different. And I think that tempers our views. And so uh, this kind of speaks a little bit to the, the, the sort of the black and white thinking you're talking about, you know, the sort of like, you're either with me or you're against me sort of thing. I, you know, you could be with someone at this point in time and then your views change and you're kind of over here now. And I think we should allow for that. I think that should be part of the process is that we change and grow and expand our ideas of things. I, you know, I, I would never have thought that I had something in common with a Jehovah's Witness until I actually met an ex-Jehovah's Witness and had long conversations about it and realized there were all sorts of things we were on the same page about. Uh, so I don't know that that is, that's, that's rarely part of the conversation, that, that your views change over time, and I think it should be. And that's, that's one point I wanted to make, um, because uh, the idea that there's only one way to, you guys were taking up the idea that there was only one way to process the Scientology experience. And I don't think you were saying that there is only one way to do it. I just wanted to contribute that thought to it that, you know, yes, of course, there's not only one way to do it because our views change. And also the other important thing about this, and this is more specific to Geyer's, some of Geyer's points, is we had all very, very, very different experiences in Scientology and in the Sea Org. You and I were Sea Org members. Geyer was not. You and I, uh, I was in management. You were not. I did the RPF, you did not, right? I had a lot more auditing than you did. Um, these are things that are gonna speak to us having different ideas about the same subject, merely because our experiences were different, so different. Geyer did the OT levels, you and I didn't, <laughs> you know? So of course we're gonna have different things to say about it. How could we possibly be 100% aligned in everything about Scientology when our experiences were so incredibly different. If Geyer had done the RPF, I am telling you, he would be saying some very different things about Scientology. Yeah. You know, there's just no way you couldn't because the RPF is one of the most abusive experiences you can you can have outside of a, you know, full-blown POW camp or, or, you know, the experiences of combat or battle or something, you know, and that kind of violence. And there you would find Sea Org members who've done the RPF but did it at a different time. Yes. You know Sea Org members to this day, or former Sea Org members, um, yep. who are critics who say, well, I, I kind of enjoyed the RPF. And you go, okay, okay, you're talking about two different RPFs, obviously. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> That's exactly right. Which actually caused me to realize, you know, if I'm going to write a book about it, I got to do the whole kit and caboodle because it did change radically over the years. And the person who did the RPF in 1974 had a vastly different experience than the person who did it in 1984, 1994, and 2004. Right. Every one of those experiences was radically different. Right. So you can't just put it all in a box and say, well, this is the RPF. Because it doesn't work that way, you know. You're okay, absolutely so right. Question. I just want to, um, before we move on to the points in the yeah, I, I want to just very briefly discuss this concept of recovery. Um, sure. You said 
you know, you, uh, you, you're in one situation, you, you think about uh, things in one way, you think about the world in one way, you believe one set of things, and then you move on and you ha that's, that changes. And that is, uh, by definition, sort of recovery. <clears throat> Why There's a little bit more to the thought that I didn't say, but yeah. Okay, okay, okay. Because my, my question would be, um, and again, this is where my personal experience pushes up against others. Uh, yeah. Um, why isn't it just as simple as I used to believe things and look at it a certain way, and now I no longer see it that way, and I think those things were untrue. Why does that um, connote recovery? Or why does it have to? Because... Um, Scientology is an almost universally abusive experience, and um, there are things that are done to you as a Scientologist. It, I mean, unless your unless your experience is, I did one Div Six course, you know, one basic life improvement course, and I'm out. Okay, whatever. You know what I mean? You sat in a classroom for a couple days, you know, for a few hours. That's not a big deal. That's not an abusive situation. I'm not going to classify every single person who ever experienced Scientology as having been abused. But at the level we were at, uh, you know, full-blown Scientologist, OT, Sea Org member, there, there is a situation there where you are being unduly influenced. You are being uh, lied to, manipulated, used. Um, it, you know, these are things that are, be, you are, you are a victim of circumstances beyond your control. Let's put I it that it. way. So the very concept of things like you are the sole cause of anything bad that ever happens to you. Right. If you right. even get ill, is it is a result of bad things you have done. Exactly. Okay. You, you, because, of, because some suppressive person that you committed over it's against. Yes. Now has power over you. I mean, that is just such utter horseshit. Right. And if and when you fall into that line of thinking, yeah. you set yourself up for an abusive cycle that's yeah. going to continue, and it propagates itself. I get. And it. that's done on purpose. I get what you're saying. So recovery from that is freeing yourself from that thought process, and thereby being able to live a life that is truly more self-determined more on your own terms, however, whatever terminology you want to use for it. I see, I see, I see. Um, and I might want to wait till we actually get to this part. But but since you did already mention yeah. it, I'm going to tackle this. You, so you Great. sent me an email with a rough outline of um, your thoughts on the video. And uh, I'm just cracking myself up because I had the same thought when I read your email. You said something a few minutes ago that implied your views have softened over time. Yes. Whereas yes. my perception of it has been the opposite. Right. Although I'm not sure I could pull out any specific examples right now. So one of the questions I just want to ask you before we tackle addressing the video I did with Gear, in what ways have your views softened over time? I have come to a place where I recognize my own contribution to my situation as a Scientologist and as a Sea Org member. Um, and I, when I first got out and when I was first speaking out about it, I had a very much, um, and not, it, it's not a factually wrong statement to say I was victimized by Scientology, that, um, but that's all my focus was on. And over time, when I say softened, I don't mean my approach to Scientology is softened, I mean that my view of my own contribution and my and the degree of my victimization has changed to a degree. Interesting. So it's not the criticism that's softened. It's maybe your feelings of anger toward it or the organization or the experience? Yes, because I have come to a place where I've recognized that I it would be toxic for me and I think wrong and intellectually dishonest for me to say I didn't have anything to do with that mm. or I was it was all done to me and I didn't do anything to other people I didn't uh, ask for some of what happened to me in a way um, and I, I'm not I'm not I'm talking about me I am not saying that this on a broad basis everybody in Scientology asked for it I didn't just say that that's not what I meant at all I meant I have come to a place where I personally see that there were places I could have acted differently and I didn't, 
and I have to own up to, and I have to, I have to own that. That makes sense. That makes sense. So the reason yeah. I think that's really interesting, because if I were to think of the typical trajectory somebody leaving the Sea Org and Scientology would travel, it seems like the first steps they would travel was thinking they were responsible for everything that happened to them. And only later would they come to go, you know, maybe that wasn't all me. Yeah, my my trajectory was not that. I can't speak for others, but I can tell you that I went from a place as a Scientologist of, I own everything, it's all my fault, everything is on me, to sitting in a room, seeing the truth of David Miscavige and L. Ron Hubbard on the internet, getting all these stories, going down the rabbit hole, and then having the, the epiphanal moment of, I was a victim. I was victimized by these people. I They did things to me I did not know they were doing. And I never agreed to any of that. I, how could I possibly be responsible for something I didn't even know about was happening to me? Mm-hmm. When you lie to me, you present a false circumstance that I have bought into. I can't take ownership or responsibility for something when it's a lie. So that, wow. you know, so that's kind of the path. And then going from seeing all the markers and indicators of victimization and, and you know, where those things were done to me. And it took a long time to get to a place, so a couple of years, to get to a place where I was able to say the RPF was absolutely horrible, awful. I mean, it was it was an abusive, you know, I, that, that I have PTSD, that I, you know, that I, that it took me, I had to go through a whole curve of this and then come back around to, oh, well, there were there were some places where I could have made different decisions and had I made different decisions that I was at the time able to make, I could have been in a different place. There were some places where I didn't have any power of choice over the decisions, where I didn't have any power of choice over what was happening to me. And those were the points of victimization. There were other places where I go, hmm, could have done that different. That's kind of on me. That's really interesting. And, and, and parsing those things mm-hmm. out has been my recovery process. Fascinating. Yeah. So instead of the pendulum being like all the way over here when you were in Scientology and then gradually moving over here, you kind of went from here to here and then kind of swung back a little You got bit. it. That's, That's incredible. Right. All right, so let's tackle the video. What, uh, what, were, what yeah. were some things in the video that you thought were off point or whatever? Uh, okay, so um, I just wanted to think, yeah, I wanted to address the thing about the recovery. And the main thing, the, the theme or the, the thread that I would sort of correct Geyer on is that I think he makes a mistake that's a fairly common mistake to make, uh, and not just in the ex-Scientology world, which is the view that if it didn't happen to me, it's not really, uh, I don't see the problem, I don't see the big deal, I don't see, they, they, they're not aware of the, the, the consequences or ramifications of that thing. Geyer never experienced the RPF. He never experienced disconnection the way I did the way Laurie Hodgson did, the way, you know, family members did. So he writes it off as, oh, people are, he literally said people are whiny about disconnection. I, I, I Maybe that's a presentation problem because he later sort of walked that back a little bit, but I don't know that he actually totally gets it. Um, and, and I think it comes from a place where he's looking at everything from his own point of view rather than, looking at a more, I don't know, in Scientology, pan-determined, <laughs> you know, a more broad, embraceive. Let's look at it from somebody else's point of view for a second. If you lost a child, if, if somebody came and took his child away from him, and I told him he was being a whiny little bitch, I think he'd probably pop me in the face, right? It, justifiably so. So for him to say that about, you know, how disconnection is not a big deal... Um, people need to get over it. You have to let it go, otherwise you're killing yourself over it. How do you get over losing a family member, your son, your daughter, your mother, your father? I don't think that's something that is that you should write off as get over it. That's not, that, that's just, it, it's so tone deaf. And, um, and it, for me, I, you know, in looking at everything he was saying, I think it comes from that place of, 
oh, I didn't experience it, so therefore, why are other people whining about it? Sure. And that's a very self-centered kind of point of view, and I and I think he loses it on that point. He's got very smart things to say about a number of stuff, but I think on that one he missed it. Um, I certainly agree with everything you just said. Um, okay. Not even to be a devil's advocate, but let me just throw this out there as um, sure. maybe a little bit of a devil's advocate. Um, <laughs> not to, well, and then I'm about to. Well, well because there's something... There's a concept there that's yep. important, um, but then the execution of it is where it gets complicated. So let's say you lose a family member to disconnection versus losing a family member to death. The difference is that um, uh, the one is a sense of inevitability to it. You cannot fix the death. Correct. You could fix disconnection uh, with a specific individual. Um, and so... Uh, uh, again, I just did a similar the conversation you and I are having right now. I just finished doing one with Nathan Rich, Better. so we're covering a lot of the same ground. And I okay. want to make I want to make sure I don't make the mistake of not bringing it up here because I already brought it up there. Sure. Um. The the concept where I go, there's a valuable concept there is if let's say you have a family member who dies, you have to be able to get over it in order to even. Uh, I don't know what get over it in this sense means, but you have to get to a point where it's not ruining your life anymore. Because it's inevitable. You can only um, do something about the things that you have the ability to do something about. So yes. if, let's say, disconnection. If someone feels that it can be fixed, then perhaps they should be trying to fix it or coming to terms with it without mm -hmm. me being able to sit here and tell you what that looks like. Mm -hmm. um, and, and again, I'm being um, a, a gracious interpretation of, of what he said would be pretty much... Um, Try to fix it or move on, but don't get stuck in it for 20 or 30 years. Uh, logically, that makes a lot of sense. And emotionally, you go, who are you to tell someone what it means to be stuck in it or how much it should hurt them or for how long? And I'm not even sure Gear would say he's the one to make that call. I think he was responding to things he has observed, which is cases where people... Uh, there's a difference between sitting, us sitting down and talking about something that happened to us 20 years ago and us just compulsively telling the world about it nonstop in a you should pity me and pay attention to me kind of way. I feel that his statement was probably in response to something he had seen previously over long duration and he wasn't necessarily referring to anything in present time. And the reason I say that is because, if you recall, after he said that, I immediately... Um, directed the conversation towards what I try to do on my channel and then I gave him a follow-up question about the TV show of whether he was trying to say that it wasn't a valuable conversation to be having right now about the things Scientology does to people and right. you know, using stories of people even if those stories happened 10 or 10 years ago or more right and he and like you said he walked it back he's like no that's not yeah. well he hadn't seen the show so he wasn't he wasn't responding to the show he wasn't responding no. to my channel. He wasn't responding to your channel. He's been so disconnected from Scientology, he doesn't watch any of that shit. So I was actually wondering, since he is so disconnected, what he was responding to. Be Whatever happened I, I, when he totally disconnected from Scientology. Uh, yeah, which was ever, however many years ago. Right. I, I don't think it's up to him to determine when somebody needs to get over it or not. Um... And so the language just comes across, like I said, maybe it's a positioning problem more than, it, more than he has a real attitude problem. But certainly the way he communicated it um, comes across as judgmental, uh, over, overly harsh, really, for a subject that is very tender and, uh, and difficult for people. And some people, um, you know, it's also just kind of counterproductive because it's not, it, it's not, you don't say to somebody who lost their kid, get over it. They're going to get over it on their own terms, not because not because you're not because they're leading their life, not according to your terms of what of how they should get over it. You know, it, 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 different people have different levels of emotional investment, et cetera. So, you know, I, that's why I kind of go from a, you know, I look at it more from a therapist point of view or something. And I go, you're going to have to let them take their time to do whatever process they got to go through to let it go. 
Maybe they never will, but those are pretty rare exceptions. Most people eventually get to a place where they can let it go. But you brought up a point at the beginning of this, which is really important, which is that it's not the same as somebody dying because there's always the hope that they can reconnect. And that's what keeps it alive. And it's hard to let go of something when there's a hope that you can reconnect. With death, it's final, man. They are gone, and they're never coming back. They're literally, they don't exist anymore. But with an estrangement, you know, you always have this, can they come back? Can they see the light? Can they realize? And that's what sort of keeps that thing alive which is why it's so, you know, it's just it's just uh, wrong to sort of try to rip that away from somebody and say you're doing them a service. Sure. Because they just need to get over it. Sure. You know? Again, and this is why and, and, and I think that's what speaks to his inexperience with that on a personal level. Sure. And this is one of the ways in which I think conversations like this moving forward, I hope, can t are going to be very helpful because we can see that Gear said something that you can tell in the comments section a lot of people found offensive. Yeah. And yet, and in some ways I could have taken it personally, but I automatically knew he wasn't talking to me. Uh, he wasn't talking about me. Right. And, and, I, and so here's actually where I'm going with this. Gears, like a personal life coach kind of guy, meaning I, I don't, I don't fully understand his industry or his job, but it has something to do with that. Yep. And I can just imagine, this is where I go. I know where he's coming from. I know what he's talking about. I can just imagine him working with someone who is, um, hung up um, in, a, in a meaningful way on something that happened 30 years ago and gear has to get this guy to get over it. <laughs> yep. Absolutely. And, and on that point, you're absolutely right. And if there's an individual case where the person is emotionally hung up in something from the past and it's affecting their life in a, in a harmful fashion in the present, you know, it's actually adversely affecting their current relationships, their current ability to make decisions, their current ability to live their life on their own terms, then that person could use some help with that. That's an individual thing. It is a mistake to apply that on a broad basis and say, well, that now applies to everybody who suffered from disconnection. Sure. And, and like you said, he did so, want... And the language he used was rather broad. And so that's why I think he got the, the harsh... That's criticism true. back on it and like you said he did walk it back a little bit not in terms yeah. of taking it back but clarifying a yeah. little bit of what he meant there um and this is i just think it's a perfect example where, where, where you can go okay i know you didn't like the words he just used but are you totally sure you understood what he was trying to say like that's right. why th i think this is very helpful you know yep yes yep he did use perhaps even intentionally inflammatory language and an inflammatory example. I think he used an example of someone having been raped as a child. I was like, damn dog, you're going out on a yeah. limb here. <laughs> yep, but, that's right. But as gross as the example was, for me, it didn't change the point he was trying to make. And no, I get it. Yeah. And, and, yeah, I get it. Yeah, cool. <laughs> Sorry. Have I, have I tr 2 you well there? <laughs> oh. Chris, you have much recovery to go. You cannot let. Oh my God! <laughs> I use the Scientology term. How dare I? Uh, yeah, I know. The, the, it's it's funny. I have my own issues with things, but that's uh, you know, I but I also know. I like I said, I have to just like I just back way off because I know everybody's got their own struggles, and it's just not really right for us to be so judgy. You know what I mean? I think we should just be a lot more understanding of each other's situations, and I think if we could somehow accomplish that we'd move the ball down the road a lot faster and a lot easier. Yeah, yeah, totally. Um, even, I mean, in the supporters of the Remini Facebook group, um, plug, plug, um, I actually, <laughs> am, I, I delete any posts or comments that start going after individuals. Um, yep. Whether it's, um, a, a, even, even almost to a fault, because um, I won't even explain it to people. I don't have time to send people messages. Um, like, even when it comes down to making fun of current Scientologists, Yep. Why waste your fucking time? We don't. It, it's not the atmosphere we're looking for. It's not productive to a conversation. Well, you're gonna make fun of them today, but if they leave Scientology tomorrow, they're fucking brave. Like, go fuck. Exactly. Off. Like, That's stop right. just this culture of attacking people, um, and let's try to understand people. And I guess this series of videos is the former Scientologists should um, at least uh, maybe spend a little more time trying to understand each other. 
when their views seem to be so different. It's, it's okay to have a conversation and it's actually, I find, I find it helpful and rewarding to understand why someone feels the way they do, even if it's the complete opposite way to how I feel. That's right. Um, what was, uh, was there really only one other thing you had a problem with in that video? No, those were, those were pretty much the things. Those are the two points that I wanted to make on it. Oh, wait, um, didn't we only cover one point? No, the other point was the thing about how people change over time. Oh. And I wanted to address that specifically to the to the first issue you brought up as to the contention that goes on in the community I, and and the views, you know, your view isn't the same as my view. I, what seems to me, and the, the reason I wanted to bring that up is because I really feel that people don't get that it's okay for your views to change over time. It's a natural thing for that to happen. It should be allowed for, it sh it's part of the process and it's completely okay. And here's, oh, and actually, here's another important point about that. Uh, people whose views have changed, Now I will cite an individual here just because he tends to be an extreme example of what I'm talking about, is Alan Stansfield, Alonzo. He ridicules and comes down on the anti-Scientology cult and these people who are speaking hyperbole and exaggerations and how dare they, and they're just black and white thinkers. Well, guess what, Alonzo? So were you. And not only that, but it's a natural thing for somebody first coming out of Scientology to be rather pissed and to speak in rather inflammatory terms about what happened to them. That would, it, it would be, it to me, a fairly normal thing for somebody to do that, to come down on that person who is a month or two or three or a year out and say, you're being an extremist. How dare you not, not recognize the good in Scientology? Dude, it took me four years to come around to realize the good in Scientology. And I, as an individual, have been noted as somebody who recovered extremely quickly from Scientology. I know people who were out 10 years before they could even say the word. So this judgment of... I've changed. How come you can't? I I think it's gross, you know, and I think it's I think it's very judgmental, and I and I and I think it also speaks to this point that people's views change over time, and you have to give them the space to let them do that. Alan's gonna love the fact that um, both. I and know. I gave him a signal boost. He he's gonna love it. No, that Nathan mentioned him as well. <laughs> of course. Okay. Okay. But Chris, I gotta say something. When I have heard people say of you and about you that you, oh my God, you've recovered so quickly. I always took that to be referencing the fact that you were so quick to say it was all bad instead of holding on to maybe some ideas that there was some goodness. Is that how you've taken it? No, I took it more that I started speaking out so quickly. Ah. It was like the next day. I mean, I, there was no lag in me getting out and speaking out. And a lot of people will go hide for a while, figure things out, go whatever. I I talk a lot. I, I, I you know it's just my nature. So um, so I wanted to, and I and I um, I have come to realize about myself, and this is this is kind of a personal thing, um, that I am susceptible to. I, 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 God, I am really, I'm hesitant to say this because it's just going to give ammunition to people who hate me, but I'm just, I, I, I got to be honest here. Okay, so um, I was in a destructive cult for 27 years. I grew up around it. Um, I was raised with a proclivity to extreme beliefs. That sort of thing doesn't change overnight. It's taken me a while to just realize oh, this could be a problem I have. You know, not just Scientology extreme beliefs, but, you know, uh, politics, social issues, whatever. Uh, my mind will tend to race toward conclusions that are not necessarily warranted by the facts. And it's always, um, I, you know, I really thank, thank the luckiness of, of me embracing critical thinking to get more facts and more information that always temper that extremism and bring me back to the middle. And um, I, I don't know how, I forgot how we got onto this exactly, but this is um, that extremist thinking of mine 
kind of maybe is what drove me to start speaking out so quickly about it is I wanted to, you know, I didn't want to destroy Scientology, but I wanted to counter all those years of being so pro that I wanted to like do something about that. And that's, that's so I think it was the speaking out part that people were so amazed by and were saying, wow, you seem to have gotten over this so quickly because I was speaking rationally about it rather than emotionally. I think that was why people said what they said about me. Because the truth is that, no, I have to recover and am recovering at the same pace as everybody else at my own pace. Right. You know? So the reason that this is, this is a good topic to dig into a little bit. The reason I sure. asked you earlier in the video about why is it recovery yeah. <clears throat> is because in many ways, I do not feel like I have had to recover. Um, and so I wanted to ask you why it was properly described as recovery. And the answer you gave was awesome because uh, for me, it's consistent with, it, it's, it, it, it's also consistent with how, why I feel how I feel. I never, and I know this is going to sound crazy, but it's just as crazy as hearing gear completely reprocess what the OT levels are about, right? Right. I never bought into the fact, um, in a sincerely held way, that anything bad that happened to me was because I was PTS or had overts. Um, I always felt that was bullshit and that you just had to kind of act like you thought that was true. Otherwise it was not in accordance with keeping Scientology working and you wouldn't be, you know, like, honestly, it was always one of those things where I was like, dude, this is such bullshit uh, because there's so many wow. internal inconsistencies in the information as well. Um, even, and I'm picking small examples now where if you're a senior and you're talking shit about your juniors, that's not because you have overts. That's because your juniors are assholes. If you're a junior talking about your senior, that's never because they're assholes. Or even if they are assholes, it's you're only compelled to say those things because of your overts. Like, for me, that was just so, really? We're going to pretend like we believe this? Come on. <laughs> um, <laughs> that is so funny. <laughs> that's so funny. And you were even a second gen. You were raised with this stuff. Oh yeah, but I push back uh, against it. In fact, see, but this is an yeah, example of how funny. the second. This is an, an example of how the second gen experience can differ. I've spoken to second gens who were so ingrained into this concept of overts equals yep. uh, PTSness um, that even after leaving Scientology, when they got sick, they would sit down and write their overts. Where I, I would almost have to f fight against this. I, like my mom would literally um, um, uh, have to. Uh, almost condemn me for being out KSW when I didn't want to get PTS handlings when I got sick. Like it wasn't okay that I didn't want to get a PTS handling. So in other words, the way I was raised made OW write-ups and PTS handlings feel more of a punishment than a solution. Right. Whereas some So how did you so how did you did you accept any part of the concept that natter equal or criticism equals overts did you accept any part of that oh totally there is a mechanism i mean there is a valid mechanism there of lessening the overts where uh -huh. if i have done bad things to you and i don't want them to weigh heavily on my conscience i can ease the pressure by convincing myself you're a piece of shit and then convincing everyone else around me you're a piece of shit as well so okay. it's, it's one of these things like a pickle is a cucumber is always a cucumber but a cucumber is not always a pickle right natter to use the scientology words can be indicative of having done bad things to the person you're being critical of but it doesn't yep. mean it's always that and that's the okay. thing hubbard contradicts himself on subjects like this so many times that it can be used as a tool of convenience if if you're the senior person um uh, you know nattering about a junior person you can point to the references that make that an ethics gradient if you're a junior person <laughs> you know what i mean there's all sorts of ways but you're you know, right I you're could, right i could see the inconsistencies i just put them on my map of how to navigate i never right. internalized and them that's so funny because <laughs> i internalized it a completely different way <laughs> and it's and it's hilarious it's actually hilarious um you know who actually sold me on overt motivator sequence, which is this whole thing we've been talking about, um, 
is Ruth Mitchell, not L. Ron Hubbard. Who's Ruth Mitchell? Ruth, Ruth Mitchell was an author from the 70s, is before your time, who wrote books about Scientology tech. She was a Scientologist. And this was a period of time where it was okay for other people to kind of interpret source, right? Sort of rework his words into secular, into more, you know, non-Scientology format. And she wrote a couple books. One of them was called How to Choose Your People, which was all about the tone scale. And the other one was called Miracles for Breakfast, which was a family-oriented book about how she used Scientology in her family life to raise her kids. I read it when I was a kid. I was like eight years old. It was a very simple book to read. Wow. And, and she had a whole chapter in there about, about overts, about wrongdoings and moral sins and how they weighed on you and made you guilty and made you criticize other people and made you fault find and all this. And I was literally being indoctrinated with this. I was eight or nine years old to the point that I had been, okay, check this out. I was so guilt stricken by after reading this. It was in the middle of the afternoon. My mom worked the night shift at the hospital, so she was sleeping. I went and woke her up because I was so guilt ridden to relieve my conscience about how I'd been taking money out of her purse. You know, a quarter, quarter here and there. You know, this was the, this was weighing on my soul, you know. And I, and I went and woke her up and I was crying. Mom, I feel so bad. I've been a bad person. I'm evil. I'm horrible. I've been committing these overts and I need to tell you about them. And she was wonderful. She's like, I literally woke her up and she looks at me and she's like, I'm really tired right now. I have to go back to sleep, but thank you so much for telling me about this and we'll totally take it up afterwards. And I'm really, I'm so thankful you're telling me this. And I just felt so, oh, felt so much relief. So those kind of experiences convinced me from very early age that this stuff was true. And so I aligned everything I learned after that, once I got to the real tech and started listening to Hubbard talk about this shit, that every part of it had to be true. And, and that was um, very uh, personal for me. So that's why I embraced that. Wow. So yeah, you can have, I mean, I've heard of people um, say, uh, I've heard of people explain to me that their conditioning was so deep, and it sounds like uh, similar to your, yep. where the moment they have a critical thought about someone. It's like, oh no, what have I done? In other words, they're not even aware of something specifically they've done, but they immediately intro, intro, introvert and go, oh, what, what have I done? And when I, when, in the past, when people have sort of explained that thought process to me, in the back of my head, I'm going, what a fucking pussy this guy is. What? <laughs> <laughs> well, okay. Well, I'll, again, let me share with you. Um, I didn't do that. I didn't sit there and go, oh my God, what have I done? All I would do in my head, and this was when I was, but you know, when I was in the Sea Org at this point, right? Or, or, or staff member later on or earlier before that was I would say to myself, oh, I'm feeling critical towards this person, or I don't like what this person's you know, I, I, I feel an, I feel an, I, I want to bitch about this person. I want to complain about this person. I'm feeling antagonistic towards this person. Oh, okay. Well, I must have done something or this person's re-stimulating some shit. Okay. And then I would stop feeling critical towards that person. Mm -hmm. I just go, oh, okay, that's it. And I just kind of brushed it off. I wouldn't go soul searching for what I had done or try to go write up my OWs or something. I just go, oh, yeah, right. And I, w and I took to heart uh, the poem Hubbard put into a policy letter. I really, I really embraced it. I really liked it. Uh, and it wasn't original to Hubbard, but it was this little poem that he, put, that he made into policy. And it was, there's so much bad in the best of us and so much good in the rest of us that it ill behooves any of us to talk about the rest of us. And I thought, I think that's the poem, right? And I thought to myself, that's fucking smart. That relieves a lot of, of conflict in an organization if everybody applied that, if they just stopped bitching and just got to work. And, and yeah, and I thought that works for me. And that was kind of how I tried to be in sure. personifying that policy. Sure. I think it's articles or little policies or excerpts like that one combined with 
um, the code of honor, combined with what is yep. greatness, combined with what is integrity, that I think yep. when Scientologists read those things, they sort of go, that they hold on to them as these golden coins of that's what Scientology is, and everything else just sort of gets thrown away. You got it. Like, well, that's right. Is Scientology what it aspires to be at its best, or is Scientology what it actually is in the real world? Which one is Scientology? That's right. And it was and it was always this ideal you're trying to attain. Right. So when you um, internalize this, oh, well, to, to the degree that you would at least, you know, look for it in yourself and try to get rid of it, when mm -hmm. you would hear other executives just being uh, very overly strained uh, in a strained manner, critical of junior staff members, did you have a way to sort of explain why that was OK? Or did you were you thinking, oh, well, these guys have overts on their juniors? That's what I was thinking. Oh, for real? Yep. Okay. hundred percent of the time. And especially when I did the RPF. Really? Oh, absolutely. The RPF was, it had the exact opposite effect on me it was supposed to. Um, and I can say, again, consider myself fortunate, lucky, whatever, that I was able to, to experience it the way that I did. But the more RPF I did, the more I saw how insane the Sea Org was hmm. and how and how much help the people in the Sea Org, the executives in the Sea Org who were ranting and raving, screaming, punching people, punching walls, how much help they needed because they were so full of their own criminal acts and wrongdoing that was causing them to to be that way. Yet at the same time, here's the entertaining two opposite thoughts at the same time that we can do. Um, also coming to my own conclusions that it wasn't my overts that were causing me to fault find and criticize. Because when you do the RPF, man, it's Roto-Rooter time. You uncover and confess everything you've ever done your entire life. I mean everything. So I had given it all up. And I could still see there were gross injustices, gross wrongnesses in the Sea Org. And if anything, it opened my eyes to that. So the RPF was the place where that whole overt motivator criticism thing, that's where I was able to reject it. Wow. So once you got rid of <clears throat> everything you thought could be the source of un unwarranted critical thoughts, you were able to, for yourself, go, well, this critical thought is based on a legitimate observation, not, a, that's right. not an overdeck. So, and at the same time, does that mean that when you finish the RPF, you are almost looking around at all these crazy execs and going, these guys should do the RPF? <laughs> no. What I was thinking was these guys need to get up the bridge. Uh, because I still believed in the bridge because I did not know what the OT levels consisted of. Uh, and I thought that going clear and going OT would be the solution for them. And that is why when I came off the RPF, the one and only thing I wanted to do was audit the staff. But going clear in OT isn't what got you to that point. Doing the RPF was. Well, no, I get that. But I thought that the RPF was just a holding action. I mean, getting your overts off is something that's only going to last for so long because you're going to commit more overts. But going clear and going OT and my level of understanding at that time, and this is circa 2008, 2009, uh, was that those were the closest things to absolutes you could have in terms of rehabilitating a you know, spiritual being, making him more ethical, making him more purely him, and that we're all basically good. So all the dramatization we were seeing of the shouting, screaming, throwing things, that was just their, you know, one, yeah, get their overts off and get that out of the way, but let's get them up the bridge because that's what the solution is for everybody for what we really all need. Right, 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 right. So everything, yeah, that was my central motivating force after getting off the RPF. My central motivation was go become an auditor and audit the staff. Because if we could do that, we could, un we could, we could remove the need for the RPF. Right. To me, the RPF was just a band-aid. It was just this thing you had to do organizationally to fix people who just got too broken. Because what we didn't have was a, were, were standard operating qualifications division staff enhancement sections because no organization was concentrated on getting their staff up the bridge. Nobody gave a shit about the staff. So 
you know, staff were always uh, sidelined. Right, right. So right. I saw that that was, you know, I saw that that was a decision that was made on an organization-wide basis, and I saw it was a wrong decision, and I wanted to personally do something about it. So that was my, that was my takeaway from the RPF as a Sea Org member. I've had a lot more, <laughs> lot more chances to, or time to look at it since and see, you know, the. the the, the the abusive stuff that you know a lot more of the abusive stuff that at the time I didn't I didn't see it that way right incredible incredible yeah um, <clears throat> okay I'm looking at the notes that you sent over to me um, yeah oh uh, I want to uh, no here I want to make sure you might have misunderstood something but let's talk about it. does BT handling seem to be a repackaging of lower level processes no 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 that that wasn't the question I asked here it was oh okay. I can see how lower level processes could be a repackaging of uh, 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 then extant forms of therapy. Um, oh, that's right. I wanted to ask you about, yeah, we wanted to I talk could, about this. But, yes. I, but what I was challenging was the idea of, well then, uh, if the OT levels, this comes down to the concept of anything that anyone has ever found helpful in Scientology is because it was stolen from some earlier workable piece of information. Yep. I'm, I'm okay with the concept, but I'm not the guy that's going to sit here and go, oh, mm-hmm, 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 that's true. If someone wants me to agree that's true, someone has to show me what was taken and from where it was taken from, and I go, oh, great. I don't, I'm not ideological in my opinions on these, in my thoughts yeah. on, this, on the subject. So I was asking Gear, what would the OT levels have been a repackaging of? Not, right. Okay. And when I say, by the way, when I say um, – that I compared grades and life repair to talk therapy. I'm not yeah. talking about in the procedure or the process, the subject matter. Um, in therapy, people are talking about the things that are bothering them right now in their lives. Uh, yeah. no, one's, no, no one walks around the streets um, feeling bothered by their body things. Right. They, they are bothered, and, and the subject of the grades are memory, communication, problems, transgressions, change, and fixed conditions. These things Correct. are subject in every human being's lives. Yes. And therefore, the process of sitting someone down in a chair, whether it's an auditing chair or a bar stool or a couch, and having any dialogue on this subject at all, with an e-meter, without an e-meter, with beers, without beers, paying for it or not paying for it, I can understand and from personal experience am comfortable with the idea that people oftentimes feel benefit from what occurs on the lower end of the bridge in a way that I don't feel compelled to challenge. When someone, Nor do I. Right. When someone talks about the OT levels, it's not that I'm compelled to challenge it. It's that now I feel an urge to understand because I do have a harder time understanding how someone derives benefits from sitting, sitting in a room by yourself and telepathically speaking to spirits. I, I say that in a derogatory way, but that's, you have to understand my disconnect is how the fuck does somebody have a win doing that? Mm -hmm. And yet, even Joey Chait, and I say even, because he's second gen, because he's not in, he's completely out. Even he said, I actually really had fun on OT3, I enjoyed it. In that interview, I can't remember if I actually drilled down and, and like, dude, you have to explain that shit to me. Tell me <laughs> how you enjoyed it. Um, since then, other people I've interviewed, I did ask them how to, well, in fact, I asked Gear, I think. Um, yeah, you know, you guys talked about it, yeah. Right, and so my point there was I feel um, an urge to clarify and understand what people mean when they say they had wins on the OT levels because it's something I don't feel capable of understanding based on my personal experience. Right. right. Well, no, totally. Right. Well, uh, there's, a, there's only one danger or one thing you guys kind of went over a little bit that um, I think is mostly something you've said before, too, that I wanted to... Just say out loud. It's not that what you're saying is wrong or bad or anything like that. Nothing to do with it. It's a danger that non-Scientologists, uh, I think, exists with non-Scientologists more than Scient ex-Scientologists, which is comparing, kind of in any way, really, therapy, psychological therapy, counseling, with Scientology auditing. Uh, it's the same mistake I made when I got out with comparing sex checks to, con to c Catholic confessions. Both of them share a commonality of relieving your conscience. 
but that's the only thing about them that is comparable. Catholic confession is a wholly different procedure with a wholly different intention, with a wholly different motivation than a sect check. And the procedure is so radically different and the consequences of these two things are so different that comparing them would be a false equivalency that could set up something in people's minds that gives them an idea that's not true. And I only make this point because I wanted to say that having experienced a little bit of therapy and having educated myself a lot more on therapy, to compare Scientology counseling, to even call it counseling, is a misnomer. Because the procedure is so fixed and so rigid and so, you know, it has to be so one size fits all that it's not counseling. It's something else. All right, well, let me and that's the, that's the only point I wanted to make about okay, okay. that. The fact that people get something from it, I'll never argue that. Of course they do. Sure. The fact that it addresses common human conditions, absolutely it does. Sure. You know, so, so I agree with all those things. So, um, and let's, let's see if there's um, a differentiation to be made here between sure. um, sec checking, especially FPRD style, RPF style, whatever. Yep. Um, and what your average Joe public experiences getting some stupid confessional form on grade two. Okay. Where there's no consequence or penalty for anything you say. Um, mm -hmm. They're not, uh, there's not this swinish suspicion driving the auditor. The, well, no, in any confessional, that is the attitude of the confessor, of the of the person doing the. No, that's in the policy. That's right in the bulletin. Swinish, suspicious attitude is the only correct I, attitude of a sex check. But that's because there aren't two different sets of policies for doing a sex check and doing a confessional. I, I, they're the same thing. I'm just making that point. I mean, I, I did a, my point, you know, a lot of sex checking. No, no, look, we we agree. We'll we'll agree, and then we'll figure out what we're not agreeing on. There's okay, cool. one set of policies, of bulletins, yep. that describe confessional procedure. Yes. However, even though there's one set of bulletins, doing a confessional is something being done for an entirely different purpose in Scientology than doing a sex check. I think that I think probably the differentiating term you're looking for is an HCO style sex check. You're right, that is, except in auditing, okay. it's usually just called a confessional form or the sex check or whatever. You're right. That's right. But, HCO style. The procedure, yeah. and we both agree that the procedure is the same. The procedure is the same. The doggedness with which you're trying to uncover crimes is not the same. Um, but it should be. But it's not. I, fair enough. But I'll just say <laughs> it should be. According to the bulletins, if the sec checker's doing his job, he's going to be just as swinishly suspicious in a public confessional that he's doing to a paid public for purposes of spiritual rehabilitation, he's supposed to be just as swinishly suspicious in that as he is in an HCO style investigatory confessional. That's, that's all I'm saying. According to the I, bulletins, I agree with you. That's what it says. I agree with you. It seems to me to be impossible to think that when one action you are going to get in trouble for everything you say. Yes. And in the other action, there are literally no consequences to anything you say. Yes. How could these things possibly be approached in the same manner? By the pre-clear, they won't be. By the auditor, the attitude is the same, is all I'm saying. By the pre-clear, you're absolutely right. Night and day. The amount of stress that a person is experiencing in an investigatory HCO style sex check, right? Versus the processing right. night and day difference. Right. Um, I will say this about the, while the consequences of an investigatory style sex check are severe and can result in financial penalties and, you know, the, the amends you have to do where it's going to take hundreds of hours of your time to make up the damage that you did and all that bullshit. That's its own thing, and that has its own set of, of abuse and, and nonsense that goes on with it. But even in a regular confessional, even in a, in a, you know, I'm paying my money and doing my bridge progress type of confessional, 
you are still led to believe that it is things you did that you're forced to find in this in the course of the sec check you are forced to go backtrack to millions of years ago if necessary to get the floating needle on the process you have to make shit up you have to therefore invent problems you're having uh, or have had and further you have to invent not just problems you had but shit you th- are made to think you did right. blowing up planets destroying civilizations you know all this bullshit uh, you know, the stuff you, you have, have to, to get off in Catholic confession. <laughs> yeah, you, the, none of that has any comparison to any other modern form of therapy that I'm aware of, right? right, right. Not licensed, actual board-certified therapy now. There's all kinds of <laughs> wooey bullshit that goes on. But when we're talking about something that has some level of science behind it, this is this this whole confessional thing is just total horseshit, and it creates, you know problems with a person later on because he's like having to sit there and make, not only make shit up but have to blame himself for stuff that he never did and that never happened right so so even there are consequences to the non-consequential sex checking and i just wanted to make that point because i think it's an important point to make yeah, no that makes sense i agree with you there um i was fascinated by the way by what Geyer was saying about his experience of the ot levels Right. Uh, you know, because of the responsibility thing. He, he, uh, and you guys brought up two points on it, I think I made some notes about, which was um, the thing about how there was, um, he felt that he was owning or able to take ownership or responsibility for his past actions and points of irresponsibility, things he would not have owned up to or wanted to own up to if he hadn't done those OT levels. Um, and he said, therefore, that he got something positive out of that. And I would agree um, that, that, is, that that is part of the process. And yet, again, it's one of those contradictory things because at the same time, you seem like you're putting the onus for everything bad on these BTs. And my view on it was kind of somewhere in the middle. Now, it's all bullshit. So we're really talking about bullshit anyway, right? But if we're going to talk about this, when you stripping BTs off of you, I see how you could get gain from that because you're assigning proper source to your own actions and the actions and thoughts of others, these BTs that you're that you're kicking off of you, and you're more able to see who and what you are personally as your own self. But but if there never were any BTs, then how are you assigning correct cause to something by that's the bullshit part. That's the bullshit part. Like I said, this is not this is not a workable therapy. I'm I what I just said was wholly a in Scientology context statement. Yeah. Okay. Not a real world statement. I know it's I know it's crazy to now, talk about and this. And if you recall, we... though, Gear also because I asked him, I said, "Look, you're given an explanation to explain how you got gained from the OT levels, but that's not what the OT levels are asking you to do. Did you?" Is this what you thought you were doing while you were doing the OT levels? And, and he explained that at least through OT3 and I think through OT4, he was still thought he was doing exactly the process Hubbard said he was doing. And it's almost like he was trying to ex- go back and reinterpret why he got gains. It was almost like he was accident- he was inadvertently accepting responsibility for things, even though the process was telling him to blame other things. And I and I didn't see it that way. You you didn't you didn't uh, see his explanation that way. No, I didn't see. I don't see the OT levels the way you're sort of characterizing them. No, no, no. no. I, OT levels is you blaming everything on your BTs. I say I don't see it that way. Oh, what, oh, oh, explain, explain. Okay, on the OT levels, you are releasing, uh, especially OT three, four, or five. You know seven, you're releasing these BTs, right? OT1 and OT2 are not BT related. Mm -hmm. And OT2, actually, that's kind of important because OT2 addresses dichotomies. So you're looking at times that you have dramatized being one thing and then being something else and then being this and then being that, being the cop, being the criminal, being the lawyer, being the judge, you know, being these opposite ideas. And that, you know, uh, uh, Geyer's not the only person who said they got... uh, 
some viewpoint shifts and changes and ideas uh, that were beneficial to them by doing that process because it kind of makes you examine your behavior and and your motivations for your behavior over time. And I can see how there could be a therapeutic value to that if, if, if we take out all the millions of years ago bullshit. Um, but as far as the BTs go, the whole point of having BTs is you have a shared common traumatic experience. That's why you have BTs, because the clustering of the Thetans is coming from this shared traumatic episode. Otherwise, you got really not a whole lot in common with these other entities. And so their thoughts kind of merge with yours from time to time, and it gets very confusing and it's sort of strange. So the point of it is to, uh, I mean, from a certain point of view, you can say, yeah, I'm going to blame it all on the BTs. But maybe from another point of view, you can go, well, look, you're sort of taking responsibility for these other beings in the same way that Mother Teresa is taking responsibility for all these people she was caring for. These guys are latched on to you, man. They're your problem, right? You got to deal with it. So you're going to go in there one by one. There's no blanket, rip them all off of you. You have to individually care for and rehabilitate each individual one and get them kind of on their way. And it's sort of a mother hen sort of thing. And you're, and you're rehabilitating their sorry selves, waking them up, and sending them on their way to go live an adventurous, wonderful life, maybe even as a newly cleared or newly OT'd, you know, being, because you rehabilitated them that way, right? And so now they don't longer have this shared common trauma that's, that's you know, ruined their existence. So I never interpreted that as, as blaming the BTs. I, again, I do get your point. Um, but I always looked at it from the point of view of, oh, you're trying to help these guys along and rehabilitate them and thereby rehabilitate yourself and your own right. causation. So actually, I, everything you said makes perfect sense to me in the context of Scientology. And um, I get what yeah. you're saying. All, yeah, all within the context of Scientology. Um, so when I, I realized the language I used blaming your BTs um, was more being like, okay, you're going to do what you just said. Take responsibility yeah. for this thing and help free it and but when i said blaming um it because there's an implied there's an implied acknowledgement there that this thing has been the source of many yeah. of your thoughts negative ideas emotions that's i meant that's blaming the negative totally. parts of you that you thought were you it was these guys right <laughs> correct but i always looked at that from the point of view yeah. of yeah ah uh, that's you know, oh, I could have had a V8, you know, like, oh, that's what that was, duh, right? That's how I always saw that uh, when I first, you know, read these things and stuff. The thing that pissed me off about it was how illogical the whole thing was and how it just did not match up with the lower bridge, it didn't match up with what Hubbard was saying, and there was no fucking way that clearing BTs off of you was going to directly improve your ability to engage in telepathy or telekinesis or the superpowers or any of that kind of stuff. These things had no relation to each other. How is it that I'm going to get rid of BTs and I'm going to be able to find my keys more easily? These two things have nothing to do with each other. It didn't, that's the thing that was, you know, that was infuriating me and the, the ridiculousness of, of the, the historical facts of OT3 I mean, right away, I was like, what are you fucking talking about? There weren't any volcanoes here 75 million years ago. What are you talking about? You know, that's the part that pissed me off about it. You know, aside from magical OT powers, um, I think what succinctly describes the promise of Scientology that I was always, uh, did fully uh, hope for and believe in, um, despite, despite the parts of Scientology that I say I never fucking bought into, there's only one thing fully stably exterior at will for me that was it that was it i didn't need to create universes and destroy planets and shit i just wanted to be able to be outside my head when i wanted to be that's all yep that's all <laughs> were you ever exterior no okay not even once no you like not and i don't mean with full perception i mean did you ever ever feel no. okay not in any way okay and I've never right. spoken to someone who's convinced me that they were. So what's your, what's your story? <laughs> well, I'm not claiming I was. 
but I believed I was. And um, and the way I experienced it was not Vizio. I didn't I didn't pop out of my head and see myself. That never happened. Oh, actually, I should say that happened to me when I was about four or five years old. Mm. But that was all pre-Scientology, had nothing to do with any of that. Mm. Um, I have no explanation for that incident, but that has nothing to do with Scientology. In the world of Scientology, I never experienced full exteriorization with full perceptics. I experienced feeling bigger. I experienced feeling like I was bigger than my body and it was an electric feeling the hair would stand up I and i would that. feel i certainly had that to the extent that i was like i'm gonna pop out of my head any second now i can feel it i can feel yep. it i know it's yep. probably gonna happen you just feel yep. fucking enormous um <clears throat> you know I and always a little disappointed that i never did yeah like how come i i feel so big right this is what it must be like but how come i can't Right. You know, you know. Um, yes, I got to do those OT levels. This seems like a segue, but it's not. Um, in in Jason McGay's videos that he did with Mark Bunker, um, yeah. he he discusses going exterior, doing the um uh, the TRs at the like the intro TRs course. Yep. I would love to ask him what what first of all what that was like for him, um, and two, how does he process that now? Because I know many people who, if they had had that experience would have never left Scientology, even if David Miscavige beat him over the head a hundred times. Right. Because of that pr that promise or hope that you could eventually get to the point of just doing that at will. That yeah. nothing could my, be great. My parents experienced that. Right. That old comm course, man, that was like in the 70s, that was the shit. <laughs> and people would sit there for hours and hours on the public level yeah. doing... You know, and, and I say that because when we were in Scientology, it wasn't usual for people at the public level to do hours and hours and hours of TRs. It was called TRs the hard way. Right. And in the 70s, that was just what you did. You just threw people in a chair and you said, start. And they just sat there, you know, staring at somebody or sitting there with their eyes closed and then graduating up to staring at somebody. And they, you know, just had, there were so many people who just popped out of their heads, they said. As a result of that, and, were, and interpreted that to mean that they were fully on board with Scientology, because clearly that means they're a spiritual entity, yeah. when there are literally about 10 other explanations for it. Right. But, you know, that's what people were told, that's what they believed, and that's how they became diehard Scientologists, and many of them are still independents to this day. Right. Because of that experience. To hear that, that gear went all the way up through OTA, and was happy with it, um... And never once, oh, this came up in the comments section, never once went exterior in Scientology um, with... Oh, I missed that he said that. Oh, wow. It's in the missed comments that. section of the video. Oh, okay. okay. I, the next time I chat with Gear, I have to ask him, um, Gear, you spend a lot of time and a lot of money on Scientology. I got it that you feel helped by doing almost anything. I got it that the whole process for you was to some degree therapeutic. Please help me understand how you overcame your disappointment with not getting anything out of Scientology. You were promised. You got something out of everything. You got nothing that was promised, at least at, from where I'm sitting. Yep. I want to hear what he has to say to that because that's those are the kind of conversations I find helpful. It yep. might just be that it just wasn't a lot of money to him. It might just be that his expectations weren't that high. It might be that he never bought the hype. There could be all sorts of explanations. But I was Well, he also has a proclivity to find the – he's very optimistic. He finds the benefit in almost anything. I mean, when you're, when you're approaching life from, hey, I can get benefit out of programming my HP calculator, I mean, he's, he's a, you know, he's, he's, he looks for that. So sure. he was always – I think that that's just a natural trait of his. I don't think that's a – Scientology gave that to him or Scientology took that away from him. I think that's just him. Yeah. And I think that's how I think that's probably what if you get a chance to ask him that question, my prediction is that that is along the lines of what his answer will be is he has always sure. found good things. But it's a know. lot of money to, to, to spend and a lot of time to spend to just feel more responsible. Yeah. Did you ever spend money on Scientology? Um, only when I left and paid 40 grand on my freeloader debt. Damn. Damn. You had a bigger debt than I did. Well, and then I also donated about 20 grand to the IAS. During, okay. when you during were in. my tenure working for the church. Okay. 
Okay. And, and then when I, they roped me into paying for the Dianetics course at Flag, and I started it there at Flag. Is, that's the only course I ever did as a public in Scientology, aside from like when I was five, um, was the Dianetics course at Flag. And I started the Science of Survival course. Okay. Um, Perfect. <clears throat> but no, I've never willingly paid for auditing. and I've never paid for auditing and received auditing. I've never paid for a major course and done a major course. Okay. I mean, it doesn't feel like you paid for it if you're just paying a freeloader debt. No, it's a whole different thing on the freeloader debt. Right, you're only paying a freeloader yeah. debt so you can not be looked down upon. Exactly, and and maintain your relationships. Right. Um, okay, last subject here, and unfortunately it's a big one, but we're just going to tackle it. I don't, I don't want to spend more than like 15 minutes on it. Um, All right, I'll bring it. This is about uh, the ways in which Scientology is or is not a religion. Um, oh yes. And I just <laughs> I have to start out with a bunch with a with a big intro. Um, <laughs> I don't actually give a fuck whether Scientology is or is not a religion. Meaning, I don't have a horse in this race. I'm not out to convince anyone that it is. I'm yep. just not the guy who's going to go, oh, it's ter oh, it's oh, it, it's terrible to people. Yeah, it's not a religion. I I just I need actual reasons that are consistent that don't only apply to Scientology but can be applied to other groups. Um, Fair enough. For me, uh, the the story of how the Mormon Church came to be is just as absurd as how Scientology came to be. Okay. Correct. I don't hear people saying Mormonism is not a religion. I mean, I'm sure they're out there, but that's not a, that's not a, I don't know. Do you hear that? I don't hear that. Do you hear that? No, 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 no. Okay. Don't hear that. Okay. Um, in 2011, <laughs> in 2011, yep. Mike Render um, gave a speech, uh, engaged in a debate at Trinity College in Ireland um, on why Scientology is a religion. Yep. That was seven years ago. I think that was when Mike was still actually an independent Scientologist. He's not anymore. But there's not a single argument he made in that speech that is not still true today. Um, and I've, I have not asked Mike if, because there's a, you know, there's a difference between saying whether something is or is not a religion and saying whether it is or is not a cult and whether it is or is not worthy of tax exemption. Everything yep. Mike says today, in my mind, is still consistent with what he said in this speech in 2011. I've never asked Mike if his opinion on this subject has changed. Okay. Um, <clears throat> So when someone says, well, Scientology requires you to um, a, a pay as you go service, it's a business. I go, you're right. I know of no other group that does that. I yep. just don't know if that's a deal breaker on the definition of what a religion is. So, um, Scientology is a scam. Uh, I agree. I don't know that's a deal breaker on what a religion is. Um, Scientology, and I'm just going down a list and then we'll talk about it. Yep, yep, um, yep. Uh, Scientology tears apart families. Uh, I agree. Uh, that's not the deal breaker on the definition of a religion. Um... What other? Uh, uh, there's so many things I could go down the line that I'm going to. Well, that it that it offers a true philosophy of, right. of religious nature for people that they believe and have faith in. So, right, and so the last thing I'll say this is the one thing I, I just said in my, um, with Nathan. For me, it hinges on this, and I'm just waiting for someone to come along with some information yep. that explains to me why this kernel isn't good enough. Okay. Regardless of what anyone thinks about L. Ron Hubbard and what he believed. Um, Scientologists believe that you are an immortal, spiritual, godlike being, and that the process of Scientology auditing, it is a sincerely held belief that this process is what addresses you from the viewpoint of that being, and that through that process, you as a being can regain your godlike potential. To me, you can wrap that up in all sorts of other crap and abuses and pyramid schemes and real estate scams and whatever the fuck you want. And that makes Scientology a bad thing that nobody should ever join. <laughs> but to me, I look at this kernel and I go, someone has to help me understand why that kernel does not meet the definition of a religion. I don't give a fuck. I don't, I'm no, not. I get it. Okay. You're, yeah, I get it. <laughs> so go I am in a, okay, so I'm going to tell you where I'm at and then we can discuss the issue itself. I am in a position where I can, uh, I, I'm in the debate club. I can take either position okay. and I could defend either position. And I think I could defend either position equally well. Um, so I, I straddle the fence in seeing and understanding the arguments on both sides. I have chosen to put forward that it is not a valid religion um, at this time, you said something very important in your interview with Geyer, which is that a hundred years from now, you'll have a full flock of people believing this stuff and 
why would it not be a religion then? And I think a hundred years from now, you could make the argument, the valid argument, that it's a valid religion. I think at this time and in this place, it does not yet fit that, and we can therefore curb it before it becomes that. So, now, now, of course, you and yeah. I agree, in a hundred years, Scientology won't exist because it's destroying itself. Now, <clears throat> now actually, I, I clarify that. As of right now, Scientology is on this kind of trajectory. That's right. Um, there has been an argument made that Scientology is incapable of change, but that argument um, is contradicted by the fact that Miscavige has already changed it in so many Exactly. Ways. That's right. So he can do whatever he wants to do and justify it however he wants to justify it. Correct. It is, there's a small chance, an unlikely chance, but still mathematically possible, that something could happen and that some changes could be made that would make Scientology more palatable to society Correct. than it currently is. And that maybe in a hundred years, okay. But what in a hundred years from now could happen that would make Scientology meet that definition of a religion for you? Here's my point on it. And this is really the crux of the matter. L. Ron Hubbard, arguably, very, very, with, with rationale and, and a very good reasoning, uh, did not believe fully that what he was doing was purely religious in nature. He had other motives, he had other interests, he had other intentions. He was a con man, he was a pathological liar. He created this thing out of whole cloth. Geyer has absolutely nailed it, that nailed it, that Hubbard was genius at marketing, at promotion of a thing that was not his idea. And Scientology is really just an amalgamation of other people's ideas um, that Hubbard put together and packaged and, and threw some of his own ideas in. But really, it's mostly other people's philosophies and ideas meshed together. Very, very, very little original thinking in Scientology. Um, knowing that and knowing how Hubbard used Scientology to amass hundreds of millions of dollars for himself, and that being his pretty clear-cut priority over the years, um, and the lies and the, the black ops and the other things, um, you know, any religion's capable of black ops. That's not a that's not a statement of their religiosity, but it is a statement of Hubbard's intention, and that's what I'm speaking to right now. Um, Hubbard's intention was not purely to bring spiritual salvation to a mass of people. He had other things going on. I, David Miscavige, arguably, is even worse. I don't think David, while you could argue, and I have made the argument that Hubbard was somewhat of a true believer because he was using auditing on himself and he was, I think he truly did fall into believing in the BTs and things like that in the end. He was also delusional and um, had, you know, suffered from you know, mental deterioration. I think that contributed to some of his beliefs as well. Miscavige doesn't get that right off. Miscavige is just straight up sociopathic. He flat out doesn't believe in Scientology. I, I, I truly believe that that is the case. I think he mouths the words. He uses it for power and authority over others, which is what he gets off on. He's not about the money so much as the money is a motivation, is a tool to get what he really wants, which is power over people. Those two people are the only leaders Scientology has ever had. Therefore, Scientology doesn't have any legacy of purity of belief. Its whole core fundamental principle of existence was to bring power and money and authority to the people who are in charge of it, not to bring spiritual salvation to its membership. It is on that that I hinge my statement that it is not a true valid religion. It uses very, very, very brilliantly religious cloaking. Mm -hmm. It has convinced its membership that there is a religious aspect to it, but even its membership, and I don't know about you when you were in, but I'm pretty sure you were in our, on the same page on this when we both say, we didn't think about Scientology in a religious nature or context when we were Scientologists. Only in one, and I, only in one regard. Go ahead. 
So when, you know, shit would get heavy in the Sea Org and I'm like, I don't really want to be fucking doing this shit anymore. I got better shit to do with my time. I would sit myself down and I would go, okay, why are we here? Remind myself, why are we doing this? Yeah. Prison planet. In between lives and plant stations. If we can get through all this bullshit and get up the bridge, we'll all be free beings free from the prison planet. Now, because I had a very uh, derogatory concept of religion as a Scientologist, I didn't consider that religious. Right. But now I look back on it and I go, well, it is, it's spiritual. It's spiritual. We're talking about eternal spiritual lives. Yes. And so then I have to ask myself, how do you separate the conversation about eternal, eternal spiritual well-being from the conversation of religion? And that's, that's where I go. I don't know. <laughs> yes, it's a, yes, it's difficult. Right. Um, it, it is difficult. It totally depends on your point of view. Yeah. My argument is that when you were a Scientologist, when I was a Scientologist, when almost every single person I knew who was a Scientologist throughout my entire experience of Scientology, which is, you know, 30 some odd years, not once did anyone ever say outside of a public PR forum, Scientology is my religion. That's right. Don't attack my you know, faith. That's right. Not once. No, no. That's not how Scientology is. The only person. Who, that's right. The only two people who ever said that in a public venue was Jeff Pomerantz and Heber Gensch. Exactly. And they both said it on a stage <clears throat> because they were making, you know, because they were court cases and, and legal fees involved. Right. So. That's what I mean when I say that it uses religious cloaking in a brilliant, genius fashion yeah. because it has convinced its membership. Right. And here's the analogy that I make, and I will stick by it. Some people can poke holes in it, but my analogy is if you sell a bunch of people water and you say it's holy water and it will cure you and they all believe it, does that mean it's holy water? No. It means you've convinced them it's holy water. That doesn't make it holy water. Just because you tell people Scientology is a religion and they say the words Scientology is a religion, doesn't, it's, it, there's a higher bar that I have than that. You right. know? And I know that they fully believe it, but there's not very many, very, I don't think there's too many Scientologists who will admit even to the fact that it's a faith-based system. Oh, no, they won't. They won't admit that. They think it's scientific. Right. Well, guess what? Science and religion don't mesh too well, guys. They're <laughs> two different things, right? Well, well look at their So market. I have I mean, these want, things as the basis of my... Oh, sorry. I didn't mean to yeah, yeah, I'm just saying. These are, the, these are the things that I base my argument on. And I can turn around right now and I can nail why Scientology is a religion. I can tell you all about it. But... I think all of that is a smoke screen. It's smoke and mirrors for what Scientology really is. Now, give it a hundred years, and you might end up with a leadership that truly believes in it and isn't in it for the money, isn't in it for the con, isn't in it for the power over other people. That's where the Mormons have arrived to. That's where the JWs have arrived to. That's where a lot of these groups arrive to if they last past their first, the deaths of their first and second leaders. If you get past that, so you start, it, and, and I'll note one other thing about this, which is that the only way those groups become mainstream religions is by tempering and softening their approach and dropping the destructive cult characteristics to become more mainstream. The example that I use, although there's many other examples to use, is the fact that the Mormons used to think black people was the sign of Cain and that you were black because you were marked by God because you were sinful and there was no redemption and black people could never become pastors or ministers in the in the Mormon church. That changed in 1978, you know, after a few decades of civil rights, <laughs> the, the, the Mormon prophet finally had a vision and they changed that, frankly, us versus them, destructive cult tendency that the Mormons had. They've become more mainstream. They got rid of polygamy. There are many, many, many other things that Mormons did to become more accepting and more mainstream 
Scientology, if it's going to survive, will eventually do the exact same things. 100, 200 years from now, Scientology would not even be recognizable to us. So let me add on to that, that I think there is one important difference that would prevent the Church of Scientology from ever getting a leadership that truly believed. Mm -hmm. There are no more OT levels. And Scientology does try to market itself as the combination between science and spirituality or science and religion. And part of that formula is just do the OT levels and you become full OT. You don't have to believe them. Just do them. And yet mm -hmm. everyone who's finished all the current OT levels up through eight knows they haven't achieved this state of full OT. They all believe there are these unreleased OT levels and the only ones who know the truth are the two or three or four or five at the very, very top. Even the guys at international management do not know that Hubbard did not leave behind anything to serve as the future OT levels. So anyone who thought they were a true believer would take power and gradually and very quickly learn that it was all a lie. That's right. I mean, that's what happened with me. I, even after I left the Sea Org, I was still a believer in the Prison Planet Full OT story. Yep. And then even after the Truth Rundown series of articles in the Tampa Bay Times came out, I was still, I was electrified by all the, the sexy drama, but I was still a believer in Full OT Prison Planet concept. Yep, me too. And then I heard from Marty and Dan Kuhn that there were no more T levels. And I was like, what? Right. Game over, bitches. Yep. Game over. <laughs> yep. Right? That was it. Yep. That was the only thing ever keeping me in. But mentally. Well, for me, it was the, it was the content of the OT levels that... I, I, that sparked my exact same revelation as you just had. Th that as well. But even if someone told me, uh, even if I learned all about the OT levels and I thought this was complete ridiculous nonsense horse shit, I, there would still have been a part of me that was like, but I'm sure the other stuff is good, right? Ah, <laughs> yeah. No, I didn't I, I didn't have that thought. <laughs> <laughs> For me, it was all about the hope. Yeah. So, but well, here's the thing. Ask, here's, okay. I ask you this, Chris. How, uh, now, yeah. And again, I'm, I'm, I'm being very limited in my view because I'm assuming that the Church of Scientology and anyone who assumes leadership would never be able to overcome those obstacles. But clearly the Mormon Church overcame some huge fucking obstacles. But you see what I'm saying? Like, as soon yep. as someone takes over leadership, they would immediately be heartbroken that they've been fucking conned. I, I agree. And I think that, um, I think something that speaks even more to Scientology's potential longevity or lack of, is the fact that it makes real world promises that cannot be fulfilled. And I think that to me is more the reason why it will never have a leadership that will be true believers. Because it promises you full stable exteriorization at will as opposed to just an afterlife? In this lifetime, right. it promises you things that, that it cannot deliver on. It cannot even come close to delivering on. Right. And the, the thing about religion and most religious philosophies and belief is it's not about this lifetime. Mm. It's about what happens to you in the afterlife. It's about what happens to you beyond this life. Scientology embraces all of that, so it's re religious philosophy. Mm. But it's making very concrete, very real-world promises of change in this time at, at this place. Mm. And if it cannot fulfill those, and it never has, and it never will, then, yeah, it will never have a leadership that can be true believers because it's a fake, it's a fraud, it's a con. Right. And and that's really, in the end, that is what Scientology is, and that's why we reduce it down to it's a money-making scam that uses religious cloaking to fool yep. its membership into believing things. Yeah. So that's why my argument of it's not a valid religion. Yep, makes sense. Yeah. Good answer, Chris. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Uh, all right. Well, um, let's leave it at that. Let's leave it at that. Yeah, cool. You know, it's something so cool about, um, there's so many parallels between what we're doing and what you see happening in the fucking world, but there's something cool about instead of people, sh there's a difference between talking to people about someone and talking to someone about them. And people behave differently. Like if I was just yelling at the, yelling at the internet about my thoughts about Chris Shelton's latest video. To me, that's the definition of being an asshole.
right. If I have a conversation with Chris Shelton about my thoughts about Chris Shelton's latest video, that's being curious. Right. <laughs> curious? Curious? <laughs> curious? <laughs> Agreed. I, I, that's, and that's actually why I uh, said at the beginning that I am so happy that you're doing this because this is, a, this is what we need. Social media is inadequate for our, our, our conversational needs and for understanding. We've re been reduced down to a soundbite, you know, methodology of understanding things. Uh, you know, we read headlines and we think we know something that when we don't, you know, it's a false knowledge. And this back and forth is the only way to really get agreement and understanding of where other people are at. Even if it's not agreement, I mean, you can get agreement with this, but at least you can get a full understanding right. of where other people are at. And I, and I encourage this kind of thing. Uh, yeah. So kudos to you for doing this. Uh, just to keep writing on this for a second. Well, one of my um, inspirations, and I feel silly saying this because it's not like we're doing some grand uh, master fucking thing here. We're just talking to each other. But yeah. one of the things that made me go, okay, we need to get the right people talking to each other about the right things to bridge, bridge some divides. Um, is uh, watching the latest interview between um, Jordan Peterson and Russell Brand, who by anyone's normal definition, Russell Brand is almost as far left as you can get. And I think Jordan Peterson gets unfairly characterized as being as far to the right as you can get. Um, and yeah, which done, he's not. He's not. But they did yeah. two, they've done two um, great interviews with each other. And the most recent one was so good. And, but the thing that struck me was that at the end of the interview, which was a couple hours long, I thought to myself, neither one of these men changed the other person's mind. They just helped the other person understand themselves. Each person understood better where the other person was coming from. Neither yep. one of them had to change the other person's mind. They just had to go, oh, I finally understand where you're coming from when you say X. That's right. It's That's not right. about changing minds. It's about understanding where the other person is coming from. And if you're not talking to each other, you can't do that. Um, That's right. And one thing I well, I'll go. I'll take you one step further, yeah. and I will say that it is impossible to change minds if you don't do that first. Oh, for sure. You know, it, maybe the goal isn't to change hearts and minds, and that's fine. Right. But if it is, you'll never get there unless you take these intermediary steps first. Which intermediary steps? The ones you just described, the, the talking, the, the laying things out, the sharing ideas, the understanding what the other person is actually saying and not talking to the straw man or the sound bites or the, the things you, the, the characterization, the caricatures yeah. that you've created of who that person is. Yeah, 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 exactly, exactly. Yeah. Awesome. Well, hey, everyone, thanks for watching. Um, any questions or comments, throw them down below and um, we'll probably address them the next time we do a little chitty chat. Awesome. Thanks, Aaron. See you guys.